welcome, welcome to the uh, seventh annual uh, Interventional Pain Management Fellows course. I am Glenn David. I'm here over at Swedish Neuroscience Institute here at Seattle Science Foundation. Myself, along with my co-chairs, Dr. Doug Beal and Dr. Ramana Nadu, welcome you to the seventh annual course here, uh, virtual course this year. Uh, as you know, no, normally we have this course uh, in a lecture uh, in the morning and uh, a, a cadaver course in the afternoon, but change it up this year to accommodate the current restrictions and uh, love to welcome you here today. We have a, a, a large array of different demonstrations virtually uh, that I think you'll be very excited about. But uh, for further ado, I want to uh, get into the uh, lecture with Dr. Ramana Nadu. So usually every year what I do is I give a 30,000 foot overview of neurostimulation and every year I do this talk, it, it tends to expand and expand and expand. This year, Glenn only gave me 10 minutes, so you're gonna get a view from the International Space Station on neurostimulation. This is gonna be a super high level overview of stimulation. Glenn already did a great job with my introduction, but uh, for those of you who don't know, Marin County is just north of San Francisco across the Golden Gate Bridge. My practice is an orthopedic practice, and so a lot of the neurostimulation techniques you'll hear about today I use with those guys. Here are my disclosures. Uh, I work with a lot of different companies, as does Doug, and uh, we're really trying to innovate and improve our space. As you know, in interventional pain management, there is just so much new and great stuff coming out. Using opioids and using steroids should be something from the past that we never use again. So yeah, we work with companies, and that's one of the reasons why we're here today, is for you as pain fellows, and if you're junior attendings out there, to get exposure to all these new technologies because this is really gonna shape your practice in the next several years. All right, here's our table of contents. I'm gonna give you a, a brief history of neurostimulation, go through the safe principles, briefly talk about some level one evidence, give you the overview of all the vendors that are out there in the space in 2020, and then lastly, show you some guidelines. So spinal cord stimulation really started with this article. If you don't have it, you should grab it. It's out of anesthesia and analgesia. And Dr. Norm Sheely, who is from my home state of Wisconsin, is a neurosurgeon. And he reported on the first case where dorsal column stimulation was performed, actually, on a patient with chronic intractable pain related to cancer. In this article, he describes sort of the limitations with peripheral nerve stimulation. He even suggests that he had done 10 cases, and at that time, Bill Sweet, Pat Wall, were already doing a lot of peripheral nerve stimulation on different targets, including the infraorbital nerve, the median nerve, the ulnar nerve. And he stated that peripheral nerve stimulation was really too focal, in that you couldn't really address entire extremities or diffuse pain. Hence why the shift towards dorsal column stimulation, and thus the birth of spinal cord stimulation. Since then, there have been a lot of changes in this space. So this is really a over 50-year-old technology. So when you talk to patients about it, they're like, wow, I've never heard of that before. And then when you tell them it's over 50 years old, they're like, what? When Norm did that procedure, he actually sutured his leads directly onto the spinal cord. Obviously, we've changed since then. So uh, soon afterwards, um, in Japan, Shimogi uh, performed epidural electrode placement. And the challenge there was, of course, you have to cross the CSF in order to uh, get the energy dose onto the dorsal columns, so you needed greater energy demands. Uh, back when Norm was doing his cases, it was simply uh, unipolar uh, electrode. In 1978, we moved to quattrodes. Then, and, and at that time, we were really using external power sources with radio frequency to transmit to the electrodes. In 1981, we have our first internal implantable pulse generator, basically the battery of our systems. In 1986, moving up to eight electrode arrays. And then in 1988, we have multi-lead IPG. So if you're looking at systems today and you think about what happened in the past, you're probably like, oh my God, I guess it did start with one electrode. I guess it did start with a single lead. Um, and you can see what's happening over time. Uh, then we got a rechargeable IPGs in the mid 90s, MRI conditionality in the early 2000s. Uh, Boston Scientific had their 16 electrode array. <clears throat> and then uh, Medtronic also had positional sense. 2015, I would say, was a really seminal year in all of spinal cord stimulation with the Senza RCT and HF10. Then became this huge discussion and debate regarding patterns and waveforms, which still persists through today. 
In 2016, uh, St. Jude at the time, now Abbott, purchased, purchased spinal modulation, or had done that just prior to this, but the FDA approved DRG simulation in 2016. And at the same time, burst ER was also approved. In 2019, NALU had the micro stimulator, so really reducing uh, the actual IPG and taking the power source back outside of the body, like we saw in the 60s and 70s, so kind of interesting concept there. And then going into the future, we'll have feedback systems. You probably have already heard about some of those already. As you can see, 2020 is not included, so weird year. All right, safe principles. Uh, those of you at UCSF, I'm sure know about this. My good friend, Dr. Poré, uh, with Dr. Elliot Krames, uh, described these principles. And really, it's an acronym for safety, appropriateness, fiscal neutrality, and efficacy. And I think these are great principles to apply to any new technology in medicine. So whether that's a cardiac rhythm management device or a pain device or whatever else, these are really the principles you should be assessing every time. These are the same things that companies look at, that venture capitalists look at, look at. so you should really be thinking about this as a physician. Is this procedure safe? Is it appropriate for the indication? Is it you know, economically neutral? Let's not say necessarily advantageous, because it depends who you're talking about. And then lastly, is it effective for that specific indication? Here's a brief overview of the level one studies we've had, again, in the last five years. Uh, a huge kudos to Leo Caparol, uh, the Senza RCT published in anesthesiology. This really set the tone. Prior to this, we had retrospective case series, uh, prospective uh, comparisons to conservative therapies. And while those studies were very important for this space, the rest of us who are outside of this field can't take this stuff seriously unless there's a level one study. And so again, uh, Senza RCT really kicked things off. The accurate study published in 2017 looked at dorsal root ganglion stimulation for CRPS compared to tonic spinal cord stimulation and burst with the sunburst study in 2017 came out as well. Gross comparison of, of systems. This is just a really gross overview. I'm sure there are people in the audience who are going, wait a second, there's some differences here, differences there. I encourage you to meet with your local representatives about all of their systems. Yes, they're gonna talk to you about the bells and whistles, but I think it's nice for you to do your own personal table just like this to figure out what things you like and what things you dislike as far as the hardware, the programming, uh, the patient care, the patient ease of use. All of those things play a role in the adoption of technology, not only for you, but for your patients. Um, so you can see some of the things I've highlighted here. MRI conditionality is a big deal. Um, I don't want to downplay it. Uh, you know, every time I, I think it's not a huge deal, I have a patient who returns and says, from one of my old systems that were not MRI conditional, I need an MRI. And so it does become a deal then. Um, we talked about the contacts evolution here. 16 to 32 is really what you'll see overall in your IPGs today. Uh, all of the IPGs have their own bells and whistles. Again, sizes, uh, rechargeable versus non-rechargeable or primary cell, um, how long that recharge cycle is. All of those things you should look at when you talk to your reps. Uh, the current versus voltage is really a thing of the past. Um, really, everything is current these days. And then patterns, like I said, is really the most sort of controversial discussion, debate you'll hear from all of the companies today. Um, many of us are kind of over it because it's constantly what you hear about. But nonetheless, I, I encourage you to try all of them to see what works for you um, and, and really listen to your patients. See what works for them, what they don't like, what they like, if they try different patterns, if they cycle, if they overlay one pattern on top of another. I mean, there's so many iterations to think about these days. It can be overwhelming, uh, but just have an open mind and listen to what's out there. For DRG systems, the only FDA approved system is that Abbott DRG stimulation system. Uh, here's the table looking at that. And then the peripheral nerve stimulation market is just blowing up here in the last several years. Uh, a big part of that was uh, improvements in evidence, which led to an improvement in reimbursement. Uh, you can see some, several of the companies here on the left-hand side. Um, they all have, their, again, their own unique characteristics. Uh, the SPR Therapeutics is a, is a two-month uh, non-permanent system uh, that uses a very small micro-lead. Uh, NALU has, as I mentioned, the external power source. Uh, Neuros is a cuff lead. Mainstay really focuses on the medial branches for restorative therapy. 
BioNS is a, is a permanent system, and Stimwave is also a permanent system. So again, I encourage you to get to explore these companies, speak with your local representatives, look at the evidence, and figure out what's best for your patients. And then as far as guidelines uh, for, for spinal cord stimulation and DRG stimulation, I encourage you to all be a part of NANS and the International Neuromodulation Society. The lead journal there is Neuromodulation. Uh, every few years or so, we publish on the NAC guidelines uh, for stimulation for DRG and then the PAC guidelines for intrathecal pump management, which Dr. Askey will talk about in, in, a, in a bit here this morning. So with that, I will I'll end. Like I said, this is a view from the space station. I know this is really brief and fast, but hopefully it gets you thinking about this whole world of stimulation. Uh, next, what we're going to do is have Dr. David uh, demonstrate a spinal cord stimulator trial, um, and then I will follow with a dorsal root ganglion stimulation trial. Thank you.